The most crucial thing that I would like to accomplish as a Max Planck Fellow is uh, to help create um, the next generation of mathematical software systems. And um, right now, with a number of colleagues, we have a large software project underway. So the name is OSCAR, Open Source Computer Algebra Resource. And um, this is intended to be such a system which will combine many, many, many new features and uh, hopefully be useful for a great variety of mathematicians working in all kinds of fields of mathematics and also may be relevant for people outside of mathematics. Um, so I already have a couple of research projects underway. So for instance, in the Excellence Cluster Math Plus in Berlin, but also I just mentioned this uh, software project. This is part of an um, endeavor with a collaborative research center. So I, I already have a substantial number of existing collaborations and I'm open to adding more, but I have no specific wish list for people to add currently. Yes, absolutely. So I, that's biology. I was always open to several fields of science and I had some previous contacts with biologists in the past. So in my previous position in Darmstadt, now about uh, one and a half years ago, I met a young biologist then in Berkeley. So he was eager to actually learn the language of mathematics and uh, I really could com start to communicate with him. And so we started a project. We have a first paper uh, which is already um, published online in the Journal of Mathematical Biology. But uh, so this is just the beginning of a, of, a, of a larger endeavor. And this is this is a lot of fun. So the most important step uh, was in I guess in 1996, when I entirely changed uh, my field of research. So um, I did my PhD in topological incidence geometry and a uh, little bit of representation theory of, of Lie algebras. Um, but in 96, um, I moved to Berlin to work with Günther Ziegler and uh, I started to work on polytopes. And the reason for that was um, for the first time in my career, I saw an opportunity to combine my interests in computer science, software, with my interests in mathematics. So actually, um, my motivation to, to, to start to pick up mathematics as a, as a field in university came from uh, using computers. So I wanted to understand the mathematics behind computers and, and everything. And, for a long time, these things just coexisted without really talking to one another. And through discrete geometry and polytop theory, I could finally combine these things. And The greatest achievement is then the software system which uh, came out of this, which is Polymake, which is uh, the workhorse of uh, our in our research ever since then and it's 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 a system which um, evolved over time and it just uh, goes along with the kind of research that we are doing so initially essentially just myself with my co-author Yevgeny Gavrilov but over time when I started to uh, supervise PhD students also the PhD students the postdocs and now it's a fairly large group of people who, which is working on these things. You want to hear something funny or you want to hear something <laughs> so <laughs> whatever floats your boat <laughs> whatever floats my boat um, a lasting impression for me was when i had the opportunity to give an invited address at a large international con conference and this was 2002 in in, in beijing um, so this was then the first international congress on mathematical software and this 
this was impressive. Also for for the entire surroundings, fancy five star hotel in Beijing with their own squash court. So this was also a satellite congress to the um, International Congress of Mathematicians and with the reception in the uh, Great Hall of the People and near Tiananmen Square. And uh, this was this was quite an impressive thing. Yeah, this was certainly a step in my career. Committee work and uh, to be to be able to 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 sustain um, mathematical research despite all the organizational things that are necessary to be done around this. So probably this is the hardest thing. Yes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I think the most important thing is. Every PhD student, every postdoc is very different. It's a non-statement, but it's it's very true. So every PhD thesis is a, is a different story. So there's various ways to 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 get at good results in in mathematics. Of course, it requires stamina and a lot of work and and education and maybe something like taste. Um, and some of these things one can learn, some of these are maybe harder to learn. So therefore it requires different skills and sometimes people who excel in, in high school in mathematics uh, become very poor mathematics students. But it's actually the same thing is true um, for PhD students. So uh, some people who are very, very good um, master students do not get to the point where they can work creatively in, in mathematical research and then become poor PhD students. And it's, uh, it's all, it keeps surprising me. It's really, it is, a, it is a step to pick up a PhD program in, in mathematics. One thing that they need to bring to the table is some social skills today, because mathematics as a field changed over the last 20 years. When I did my PhD, the, the standard for publication was that there were, these were single author papers. So most of the papers were single authored. Now it's different. So now the majority of the papers uh, comes in teams of two or three even more, which becomes difficult sometimes. But so there is a need for cooperating in order to, to do this. And one needs to have some amount of social skills to be able to do that. Of course, intellectual powers are necessary too. So this is a given. So my favorite millennium problem was the Poincaré conjecture, I can say. so done over with it. Um, why? Because it's, uh, I was always interested in geometry and uh, topology. So this is the one number, number one millennium problem which is nearest to this area. And it's uh, just a fundamental question about the shape of space. It's period, end of story. I, but it's solved thanks to Perelman's wonderful resolution of the geometrization conjecture. And then the Poincaré conjecture as well. But there is a, I should add, there is, there's another list of open problems. And this is Smale's list and of uh, math problems for the 21st century. This is also famous, um, maybe not as famous as the Millennium problems. And on this list, there is one problem, this is number nine. And this is about the exact complexity status of linear programming. Sounds like a computer science problem, but it's a very, very, very deep math problem. And that's my favorite And um, on, on that list. And on that topic, I, I worked a lot over the last, I don't know, 10 years. The future of mathematics lies in software, so to some extent, of course. I mean, paper and pencil won't go away, and they shouldn't. But um, it, is, uh, it is just a given so that the computer just influences every aspect of our life. Every, right? And so and it influences all areas of science. So why should mathematics be an exception? So it would be completely unnatural, in particular, 
since uh, mathematics is um, at the very foundations of, of all these computers. So it's the most natural thing that computers help to do mathematics, but it is not an easy task because so one of the greatest achievements of mathematics so far, and uh, in particular the mathematics of the 20th century, is a very concise notion of a proof. This distinguishes mathematics from other areas of science, um, that via the concept of a proof, we are able to get at eternal truths, right? So we prove something and then we can be sure if there's not a flaw, then we can be sure that, that these results will be valid in the 21st century, in the 22nd century, and so on. So conversely, we, if we go back in the history, we could look up fabulous books written by Gauss and his results on quadratic forms, for instance, um, are still valid today. So, and uh, so the challenge, and uh, so this is also, so some people are still reluctant to accept a computer as a tool for doing mathematics. And so to a large extent, this is, uh, this is psychological, I think, but also there's a practical aspect and this is really considerable. And the practical aspect is, so how can we bring in the computer as a tool for doing mathematics without giving up our established notion of proof. So, and uh, so uh, this is um, in a deep sense, the question, so to what extent can we trust the, the computations that we, that came out of the computer. And this requires a um, substantial answer, both from an intellectual, on an intellectual level, but also on a technical level. And it, it requires to develop these techniques. But there's, uh, it, it is very clear that, um, that we need techniques to take current computer power and turn it into mathematical knowledge. And um, so formal proofs are one concept, very successfully established um, for proving a Kepler conjecture, for instance, by Thomas Hales. But um, this, is, this is one answer, but this will not be the only answer. So we will need to also incorporate mathematical results obtained by a computer, which are in a way too far ahead to be uh, controlled by formalized proofs. In a way, formalized proofs are too slow. And uh, so the, to, cope, to, to be able to um, keep up with the, with the levels of uh, current computation. But the very good paradigm is to, to see how classical mathematical proofs um, have been dealt with in the past, because there's numerous famous papers which were very influential for mathematics, but which contained errors. So how did the community work with these things? Well, so these errors eventually got fixed. So the results were superseded by corrections. So previously wrong results were superseded by corrections and they made their way into the mathematical knowledge. And uh, so this is, a, this is something that we need for mathematical computations as well. So we need to have ways to document this thoroughly that everybody who wants to look at data can actually do this, can maybe repeat experiments, can build new experiments on existing data, spot errors if there are any, and um, help to contribute to correct them. This asks for technical support to do that, uh, but this also asks for some social acceptance on how to deal with these kind of things. This asks for um, um, properly attributing, uh, so individuals, people's um, contributions, uh, in particular for fixing errors and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is, it's a long-term endeavor. This is also something that I would like to support and uh, so with this visiting with this Max Planck fellow position here. Absolutely, in every respect. So science only, uh, there is no other form of science for me. No, I'm, so this includes open source software and everything. So yes, 
Absolutely. There are a couple of long-term projects that I have. And um, so uh, one theme through my research over the last 15 years was tropical geometry in the combination with combinatorial optimization, to, so roughly speaking. And this smells night problem about this exact complexity status of linear program is kind of part of this. And uh, so, so this will continue and uh, software helps. So for creating examples, for just exploring things experimentally, but also now and then you end up at challenging classification problems, which are just too large to be done by hand. So then again, you do this by computer if need be. And um, there's a there's an interesting going back and fro between the software and the mathematics for me. And this is what I like. This is what I want to continue. But then there's always these accidents. You go to a conference, you run into someone who is giving an interesting talk, and then this just gives an additional direction. So this is our this collaboration with this uh, Will Luddington, this biologist, um, came about. As I said, I keep repeating myself, so I would like to finally settle Smale's ninth problem. So the difficult thing about it is I conjecture, so now I'm, now I'm a little bit bold, I conjecture this, this will have a negative solution. And um, the trouble with this would be that it is not clear, so what an, so which exact form as a mathematical statement a negative solution should be. So the trouble is it is not talking about an individual algorithm and its deficiency, so its complexity or its so that it is uh, its worst complexity is at least as bad as this and that. So this won't do the trick. So because it is really solving it is talking about um, an algorithmic problem per se and all algorithms which would solve this problem no matter how. So it's kind of a higher level of abstraction and it's, um, it requires to develop entirely new tools to talk about um, such a large yeah, about this uh, such an algorithmic problem in such a fundamental way. So there are all the preliminary results which exist. Just make assumptions on the class of algorithms uh, used to address this problem. And uh, to, to, to get around this fundamental restriction, so this is the biggest challenge. And that that's, would require a couple of really bright people, I guess. I do it not often enough, but if I can, I do photography. <laughs>